a very good afternoon to one and all of you. We shall go on to our session on preferred practice guidelines uh, related to pediatrics, neuroophthalmology, and oculoplasty on some of these aspects. And we have with us an amazing set of expert panel, and we have top notch speakers in this session. We have with us prolific surgeons and great teachers like Dr. Pradeep Sharma, Dr. Sujata Guha, Dr. Love Kochave, Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, our superbly capable editor IGO, Dr. Santosh Honavar, who has yet to join, and Dr. Usha Kim to guide us along. And of course, our past president and uh, I would like to say past chairman ARC2. I like adding that. Dr. Grover is with us. We shall start with our first speaker, Dr. Arun uh, Samprati. He is going to be talking on Child with Crossed Eyes, a Beginner's Guide to Strabismus Evaluation and Strategizing Treatment. You could share your screen, Doctor. Le uh, before I start, you have to, uh, the hall or the coordinator should take care that the talks are over by six minutes exact. Fifth minute, you would give a, a, a warning sign and six minutes it get over because I would want this session to do have some amount of discussions because too many the top people are here, the audience has to gain from yours. Thank you. Okay, ma'am, we'll take care of that. So can I start, madam? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Am I audible and is it visible? Uh, hello? Am I audible? You are audible and visible. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chitra, madam, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, today, I'll be speaking about evaluation of strabismus and strategizing treatment. Often, uh, strabismus is uh, uh, perceived as a very difficult uh, subject because I think probably because of the teaching. And unless we have teachers like uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, uh, we may find uh, orthoptics difficult. But orthoptics is simple physics and maths, and any general ophthalmologist can start practicing or uh, orthoptics. So a few essential uh, equipments which we need. One most important thing I would like to highlight is the accommodative target. So you can see here, uh, totally straight eyes, moment you put the accommodative target, you will get a gross esotropia. Then you need occluders, uh, the prisms to measure the squint, and uh, pediatric vision charts are important, uh, particularly in uh, uh, preschool children, and the stereoacuity charts, and most importantly, the brain, which is tuned to seeing strabismus cases. So coming to the examination proper, we need to find out what are the things we need to uh, get the information regarding uh, the strabismus. First is to diagnose amblyopia. Second is to know the status of the binocular vision. Third is measure the deviation. And fourth is establish a cause for the strabismus. So the steps of examination can be like, first is to check the BSV. Next is to diagnose amblyopia. And third is to check the motility and the cover test. And finally, measure the deviation. And with the help of all this, we come to a diagnosis in strabismus. Uh, history is very important. The time of onset of the squint is important. So if the squint starts early and if it is constant, it has a higher risk of developing amblyopia and loss of binocular vision. Try to get maximum information uh, before you start actual examination because once you uh, put the torch and examine, the child may become uncooperative. Uh, coming to the steps of examination, first we'd like to see the binocular vision because once you dissociate the eyes, you may not be able to get an accurate measurement of the BSV. And these are the different tests which are used for the diagnosis of binocular vision and this the Titmus flight test is the most commonly used. Uh, these are the other tests of fusion and the uh, work order tests all of us have in our uh, ophthalmic units. It tests the uh, peripheral fusion on distance and foveal fusion on near. Next step is to diagnose whether the child has amblyopia or not. And in this, the fixation pattern is very, very important. So if the child uh, is not fixing properly, or if the, uh, there is a fixation preference to one eye, then indicate, that indicates that there is a, a problem with the uh, vision. Of course, in older children, it's much easier to diagnose amblyopia. Coming to the motility examination, the first thing we notice is the head posture. So in the head posture, we have three components. One is the face turn, the chin elevation, and the head tilt. So many a times, this head posture itself will give, to, uh, give a clue to the differential diagnosis. The second step is to see the cover test. So however, cover test requires a cooperative patient with a good uh, central fixation. It has three components, the cover test, the cover, uncover test, and the alternate cover test. So here we see the cover test. So we just place the occluder over the uh, no, fixing eye and look for the movement of the other eye. So here it's coming in from outside. So this patient has a exotropia. In the uncover test, you look for the 
movement of the eye under the cover. So this is uh, useful in diagnosing four years, the latent uh, strabismus. Coming to the alternate cover test. So here you dissociate the two eyes by placing an occluder like this, you can see. So thereby you get a total deviation, the tropia plus the phoria. So this is a very important test. So it gives us uh, uh, accurate diagnosis of the amount of, uh, sorry, the deviation, the total tropia plus the phoria. Uh, next is to see the uh, ductions and versions. Ductions are unilocular movements and versions are binocular movements. So then we see the vergences, the convergence and the divergence. So after having done the cover test, we go to the last step that is measuring the deviation. So normally the commonly used test for measuring deviation is the one of the Hirschberg test, the Krimsky test and the prism bar cover test. There are other methods also which can be used. Coming to the Hirschberg test which uh, uh, measures the angle by in terms of degrees. Uh, so here, if you to assign, uh, if the examiner sits right in front of the patient and is exactly behind the light source, and if the light is in the center of the pupil, then the uh, eye is orthotropic. If the, uh, the light reflex falls at the pupillary border, then you have the 15 degrees twinge. If it is between the pupil and the limbus, then it is 28. And if it's at the limbus, it is uh, 45 degrees of strabismus. So Krimsky measures the same Hirschberg test with the help of prisms. So here you place a prism uh, with the apex towards the deviation in front of the fixing eye so that you observe for the moment of the uh, deviating eye. So once you center the uh, deviation, then that is the angle of uh, strabismus. So here you can see in this, uh, sorry. sorry, video is not playing, I'm sorry. Uh, next is the alternate uh, prism bar cover test. This is actually the very important one because it measures the total deviation. So here we dissociate the two eyes and then movement. Uh, I'm sorry, my video is not playing. So here we uh, dissociate the two eyes and uh, measure the movement of redress by increasing prisms in front of the deviating and the uh, fixing eye. And uh, this test is done for distance and near with and without glasses and uh, in all the directions, nine directions of case. So once you have all these tests, you will come to the diagnosis and in some cases you may require a special test like the uh, diplopia test or the PARC three steps test or the post-duction test. And cycloplegic refraction and fundus examination is the most critical part which should never be missed in any case of strabismus. Coming to the treatment, uh, the first step will be to uh, do a proper cycloplegic refraction, give the glasses, next to treat the amblyopia and then finally correct the deviation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a, a straightforward question to ask Dr. Pradeep Sharma. What is the role of measuring AC by A ratio when the near isotropia is more than distance? So I'm impressed by Dr. Chitra getting so much well versed with our pediatric ophthalmology. So real uh, salutes to that. So the AC by A ratio is really important to differentiate a high AC uh, by ratio would cause a convergence excess isotropia. So in cases of isotropia, you should be seeing if the uh, isotropia is more than 10 prisms on the near fixation, that may be because of a high AC by ratio. Similarly, in the exotropias also, the AC by ratio would have a bearing in the presentation of the uh, distance near disparity. And it may also have a bearing in taking care of management. Like if you have a high AC by ratio and a person having a divergence excess, one may use a high myopia over minus correction may be given then how does a high refractive error uh, influence measurements when it is done over the glasses? Yeah, I think that's a very excellent question because high refractive errors will induce prisms. So when you're having a spectacle correction for high refractive errors, it will induce a prismatic deviation. So one has to be careful about it. And there are tables available or there, are, there is a formula which is there, which you can take care of. That amount of the uh, deviation will change as per the induced prismatic effect. Uh, does it make sense to stack one prism over the other when measuring large deviations? Yeah, I think that's again a very important uh, point that Dr. Chitra is making uh, aware for the PGs and residents that one should not stack prisms one over the other, uh, especially if they are in the same axis. For example, horizontal over horizontal will make it, it's not 2 plus 2, 4, it becomes 2 plus 2 equal to 5 in that literal sense. So the measurements would be wrong. But you can stack a horizontal over a vertical if you have to do, but always play is, uh, split the two prisms between the two eyes 
so that we do not have this error of measurement. Okay. Uh, so, oh yes, Dr. Kavita is there. Thank you very much, Dr. Pradeep. Our next speaker is Dr. Kavita Kalaiwani, who's going to be talking about cataracts in children, how to standardize and optimize our results. On to you. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. So, uh, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yeah, is she check whether it's moving to the next slide? I think it's not, no, for you? Not moving. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So cataract and children, how to standardize and optimize. That's what, uh, so why do we need to know this? Why do we have to have a standard, of course? So the dilemma when it comes to pediatric cataracts is uh, it starts from, because adult cataracts and pediatric cataracts are extremely different in every way possible. And even juvenile and infantile cataracts are very different. Unilateral versus bilateral cataracts different. Non-surgical, there is sometimes a role of non-surgical management in uh, pediatric cataract. And some, we have to decide whether IOL has to be implanted or not and early versus late. So there are a lot of controversies and uh, dilemmas. So we need to have a consensus. So that's why this uh, issue. So how is adult and pediatric cataracts different? They are different in uh, the way they present etiology, in laterality, age of onset, whether to operate, when to operate, who operates, whether we implant an IOL primarily or later as a secondary procedure. Inflammation after the surgery is very different in pediatrics as compared to adults and post-surgery follow-ups is very, very crucial when it comes to pediatric cataract management. So how is infantile cataracts develop, uh, different from juvenile or uh, developmental cataract? So as we know that pediatric eyes, especially first 24 months of age, there is a maximum myopic shift happening. And many of these situations when they present with cataract at that age, they can be associated with microcornea, PHPV and other um, ocular abnormalities. And surgical expertise can be more challenging when it comes to managing an infant with cataract than in an older child. And of course, anesthesia related issues also come into play. And when it, when it comes to cataract in children, we need to decide whether do we do an elaborate investigation or we just manage the cataract. So when it comes to investigation, we need to know the etiology. So in unilateral, bilateral, etiologies can be different. So bilateral, most commonly it's idiopathic, otherwise it's congenital or developmental. Again, idiopathic is commonest. Okay, we'll call me. Next commonest. And if they present at birth, some you have to look for torch and inborn errors of metabolism. Steroid-induced cataracts can be bilateral. Unilateral, commonly idiopathic, but again, trauma is common in unilateral cataracts. It can be part of an anterior or posterior segment anomalies and steroid induced cataracts can also be unilateral and uveitic cataracts can present as unilateral cataracts. So in a, a nutshell, unilateral cataracts, you look closely for eye anomalies, whereas bilateral cataracts, you look for systemic issues. issues. So to operate or not operate, does the, is this even a question? Yes. When we do face this question, that when, the, when there are no symptoms, sometimes pediatric cataracts can be just an incidental finding. They may not have any symptoms, at least in the initial stages. It can be bilateral symmetrical cataract. Then we decide whether to operate immediately or not. And if there are no secondary effects like nystagmus, strabismus, or anisometropia, we still can manage it conservatively for a while. And when it is non-progressive. And when we decide to operate, how early do we have to intervene? So indications for early surgery, it's unilateral as a eight weeks, it's like an emergency. Or a a asymmetric cataracts behaves like unilateral cataracts. Bilateral dense cataracts, you can wait up to four weeks, uh, four months and operate. And secondary effects, if it's present, it warrants early surgery. And when we do surgery, do we mean I will at the primary sitting or not? So that again depends on uh, age of the child. Because younger the age, DVR surprises are very common and we don't want a bad uh, post-operative refraction rather than in a good aphakia. Myopic shift has to be looked into and laterality of the cataract, like I said, sometimes unilateral cataracts, you want to implant an eye world at an earlier age so that it's easier to rehabilitate. And corneal diameter is of course very crucial and axial length should be at least of a minimum size to implant a primary eye world. So physical parameters, like I said, more than 10 mm is a safe corneal diameter, normal intraocular pressure, no angle anomalies, and axial length of above 16 mm is ideal for primary eye oil implantation. So at one year, um, less than one year, do we implant eye oil or not? So IATA study has told us comparable results with contact lenses and eye oil. So we have to consider the other um, parameters before we decide to implant eye oil in less than one-year-old children and use standard tables 
like SRK, SRK2, Hoffer Qs, SRKT, etc. Target refraction depends on the age of the child. So we use standard uh, target refraction for uh, as young as possible, even four to six weeks, we aim at eight diopter of res residual hypermetropia. And uh, after two years, we can undercorrect by 20% and above four years, uh, four to uh, up to four years, above undercorrect by 10%. After eight years, we aim for emetropia. So eye oil, the preferred eye oil is in the back, acrylic hydrophobic single piece eye oil. If it is in the sulcus, you can use a three-piece eye oil. Ideal optical diameter of the eye oil being 10.5 to 12 mm. Steps of surgery is very similar. Um, sorry. So you do a good anterior capsulorexis, which I feel is a very important step for a pediatric cataract surgery because even if posterior capsule is a it has a dehiscence or we lose the rexis, the sulcus is intact. So anterior capsulorexis is the most important step I feel in a pediatric cataract surgery. And for children younger than eight, uh, we prefer to do a posterior capsulorexis of a, at least four millimeters uh, in uh, diameter. And eye oil in the bag is the preferred uh, placement of eye oil and suturing of the wound ideally in very young children. So you can do a scleral or a corneal tunnel and posterior capsule management is extremely crucial till six years of age since the rate of PCO, managed, PCO is almost 100%. At least four mm opening should be made and you can do it with a manual uh, rexis forceps or a vitrectomy cutter. With anterior vitrectomy, it's a preferred choice because vitreous can also So anterior vitrectomy, it is a timeless option, easy to perform, extremely safe, extremely effective and it's the gold standard. But optic capture is again another technique which can also prevent equally with PCO formation after surgery. Sorry to interrupt, ma'am. I request you to please sum up. This is the last, uh, last uh, step. So once surgery is over, of course, uh, uh, amblyopia management and the glass is refractive correction is extremely important. So now do we have a consensus? So yes, primary eye oil implantation is extremely safe above the age of two or even one now. And standard eye oil formulas can be used with a target refraction of under correction up to the age of eight. And uh, PMMA lenses or, I mean, acrylic lenses are fully replaced now and placement of the lens in the bag is the preferred choice and PC management till the age of eight. So, so take home, uh, early surgery doesn't really translate to early eye oil. So that is what we need to know as pediatric ophthalmologists and not uh, uh, jump into putting eye oil at a very, very young age. So thank you, thank you for your patient care. And sorry for that overshoot. Thank you, Dr. Kavita. Uh, now we'll just move on to the next talk, uh, which is by Dr. Murlidhar. How, when, and what of paralytic strabismus, the outline of management. Dr. Murli, a prolific surgeon and an outstanding, uh, his knowledge is outstanding in especially paralytic strabismus, Dr. Murli. Thank you, thank you for the kind words, sir. So can you see my screen? So uh, I'll be talking on how, when, and what the paralytic strabismus, just aiming to give a broad overview. So these are the characteristic features of paralytic strabismus. Uh, most important, that uh, deviation is maximum in the direction of base of the affected muscle. And uh, paralytic strabismus, one important thing that we need to realize, uh, that we need to identify is this floating saccade. Okay, this, uh, I mean, in young children, they may not be able to do a post duction test. So, identification of floating saccade as in the right eye in this patient can help us diagnose paralytic strabismus. And uh, in the history, it's very important that you ask for whether it's history of monocular or binocular. And other than these, you also need to ask for history of COVID. I shall cover that in the uh, slides to come. And uh, in the history, you need to ask for history of, uh, other than all this, you need to ask for history of malignancy, which is often missed. History of ocular sinus and neurosurgery. The strabismus evaluation is as per a committed strabismus in addition to some special tests which I should cover in the slides to come. For example, this patient has a right sixth nerve palsy. He has a face turn to the affected side and restriction of abduction. This is on duction testing, which is very, very important. So restriction of abduction on duction testing, that's what we need to uh, look at. And floating saccades I have already uh, said. So uh, you see that the uh, abduction is restricted even on duction testing. So the uh, restriction of movement may not be that obvious always. This patient had a vision of 6'6 
and presented with uh, a slight disturbance in vision and uh, double vision. He had an increasing hypertrophia to the left, but the movement restriction per se was not very obvious. He has a left seventh nerve palsy. He had corneal hypoesthesia and bilateral disc margin blurring. So this is the video. If you see, the movement restriction may not be very obvious. He has a small isotropia on looking to the left. The movement restriction again is not very obvious. So that's how we diagnose six nerve palsy. And he has this very characteristic feature. Look at the characteristic of nystagmus in this patient. Large amplitude, but low frequency on looking to the left. Whereas on looking to the right, it changes characteristic to high frequency, low amplitude nystagmus, a very typical Grunt's nystagmus. So, uh, history, uh, sorry. Yeah, very typical Grunt's nystagmus. So, this patient had a CP angle tumor, very textbook description of CP angle tumor. History is all important. This patient developed a red eye when she was traveling in a bullet cart after she sustained injury with a hook. So, this is a sharp injury. And this is what we found on table. The lateral rectus is avulsed at its insertion. And we managed to restore uh, alignment after surgery. So, as I said, history of malignancy is very, very important. So this patient presented with a double vision on looking to the right. He had a history of oral carcinoma and undergone radiotherapy and chemotherapy, 16 cycles. Note that this is an oroantral fistula. This was a CT scan at, uh, uh, I mean, before the chemotherapy. It had since healed. And he was almost two to three, two years in remission. And these are his findings. Note the subtle uh, abduction restriction. There is a slight uh, increase in isotropia on looking down, not a significant weak pattern. The isotropia increases on right gaze and for nearly is ortho. That is very characteristic of 6 nerve palsy. For near, they may be ortho. And if you review the MRI, you see the broadening of cavernous sinus. There is a cavernous sinus infiltration because of the perineural invasion of the cavernous sinus. So, botulinum toxin uh, in patients who have uh, atherosclerotic risk factor, it could be a temporizing measure, especially if the patient has. Uh, especially if the patient has other commitments and uh, he wants to relief of double vision. So, uh, I grab it with the Aruga's forceps and use a 30 gauge needle to administer botulinum toxin into the medial rectus. So, uh, this is before and after Botox. So, in case uh, you uh, have passed almost six to nine months without the lateral rectus recovery, then these are the key points whether the uh, lateral rectus is working or not. If the lateral rectus is working, a recess resect procedure. Uh, usually gives very good results, excellent gratifying results. If it, if it is not working, you have to do a transposition procedure, uh, a Hammershim procedure, for example. A Hammershim, or you have a, a wide variety of procedures like the uh, Nishida or full tendon transfer. And you can augment it by various modifications like uh, Brooks. This was the patient that I had presented. The LR was not found, and LIR was, I spoke. This is the Hammershim procedure. And likewise, the superior rectus after freeing the superior oblique is full. And uh, once that has been done, they are both transposed to the um, side of the lateral rectus. Yeah, so uh, this is before and after. And this is the third now policy. What we uh, need to evaluate, what the residents need to know is that uh, they need to check the intorsion on attempted down gaze. So that tells you that the fourth now is working. This is very important and a pupil involving third nerve palsy, any third nerve palsy in a young, please advise MRI and CT angiography. This patient had a PICO aneurysm. And um, management, if we again on the same lines, if MR is working, well and good, go ahead and do a recess resect procedure. If it is not working, you have the choice. Like in this patient, it's not working. So you can do a you know, precarancular fixation, globe fixation, or you can do a deactivation, as in this patient, or you can do a LR to MR transposition. So I think I'll wrap up with this. So this uh, patient uh, recovered from COVID a couple of months back and presented with uh, 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 diagnosis of, uh, I mean, presented with double vision. If you note, there is a right inferior palsy and there is a left inferior. The patient has developed myasthenia gravis. He had a frozen glow and um, this was, uh, and he had lost vision in the right eye, the central retinal artery occlusion and had a pan sinusitis. So I think I'll wrap here for want of time. I will stop uh, screen sharing and uh, over to you, uh, Rohit sir and uh,
Thank you, Dr. Morley. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we'll now move on to the next talk by Dr. Pradeep Sharma, who will be speaking so on managing wriggly eyes and getting the best of nystagmus evaluation. And sir, of course, needs no introduction with his uh, talk. Sir, please. Uh, okay. So thank you very uh, much, Dr. Rohit, for that introduction. And as the topic is uh, mentioned, that's uh, managing wiggly eyes and getting the best of nystagmus. In a short time, we need to just understand that nystagmus is a rhythmic, regular oscillation of the eyes. And we should always uh, rule out a physiologic nystagmus, which may be an optokinetic railroad, vestibular endpoint, or a voluntary nystagmus. And we should also distinguish nystagmoid movements, which are irregular, and these are not rhythmic. And uh, these may be like uh, the HB phenomenon or the convergence retraction or opsoclonus. The nystagmus in childhood, we will see in these uh, categories, the sensory nystagmus, which is usually requiring an eye examination because they would be having some problem in the vision. So look into the fundus and ERG and other tests may be required. The more commoner one that we see is the infantile nystagmus syndrome, earlier known as congenital nystagmus or a manifest nystagmus. But mind you, this is not congenital and we should call it an infantile nystagmus syndrome. The second commoner one is the fusional maldevelopment nystagmus, also known as the manifest latent nystagmus. And a third, which is less commonly seen in infancy, is the nystagmus blockage syndrome. There are some other which are marked in red because you need to remember that spasmus newtons or a seesaw nystagmus or a vertical nystagmus in a child should always require an imaging to be done to rule out uh, an intraocular space of condition, intracranial space of conditions. So if you have a sensory pendular nystagmus, which looks like this, two and four movements, now these are uh, going to be having some uh, problem in the retina. So look for the fundus and order an electroretinography or an EOG to find out the cause. The infantile nystagmus syndrome that we see more commonly is a bilateral conjugate uniplanar horizontal mostly nystagmus. And you, as you see in that video, a child may have triangular waveforms in the initial first six months or 18 months, and then it becomes a jerk nystagmus. Uh, it's important to see in these children that we should distinguish an adduction null. Many of them will have a null which is eccentric from the primary position. Now this child, as you see, has a face turn to the right and a null. When I covered the right eye, which was in adduction, he still maintained the head posture meaning there why that this is an eccentric gaze null and not a adduction null. How does the adduction null look like? This, one. Now, this is the other child who has a manifest latent nystagma. Now he is now fixing with the right eye. I covered the right eye. Now what happens? He is going to switch his face turn and take up the left adduction null. So this is typical of a manifest latent nystagma. Whereas the first one which you saw was maintaining with that, so it was an eccentric Pradeep, case. Dr. Pradeep, he is one of the best. Yeah, there's some crosstalk, I think. Please uh, keep mute all the uh, speakers. Yes. The manifest latent nystagmus may also be having an associated squint, like this girl who has an intermittent divergent squint. And see what I do when I break the squint with the Spillman occluder. The moment the IDS becomes manifest, there is a manifestation of the uh, nystagmus also. Now, this case, if it is so, then we just need to correct the squint. Infantile esotropia may have an associated Chiantia syndrome or IENA. What this has is that they have a uh, adduction null fixation, and this may require, in addition to the esotropia correction, a posterior fixation or a fardon on the medial recti in order to correct the head posture also. The examination of nystagmus thereby would be looking for the head posture for distance and near both, looking for associated albinism like this girl has or any associated squint. And the face turn, if it is there, then you need to measure how much is the face turn. There may be a periodic alternating nystagmus, which may keep on changing every three to five minutes. So observe such children for at least five minutes uh, in a constant manner to, in order to not to miss a periodic alternating null nystagmus. The vision would change in the null position as also if you cover one eye in a manifest latent nystagmus, so a bilateral vision assessment should always be done in such children. A spasmus Newton's child will have an asymmetric nystagmus like this. They usually have a head tilt, torticollis, and a fast moving nystagmus in the left eye, as you can see, with the larger amplitude. Have a closer look. You need to always keep spasmus Newton's in, a, in mind in a child 
coming at one uh, and a half years of age. And if there is always do a IC SOL exclusion, a chiasmal glioma by a CT or an MRI. Uh, an astagmus blockage is less commoner. So in childhood, you need to keep on these points, which I just talked about. An electronystagmography, if it is available, you can do. Video nystagmography can be done, and we can see the pattern of the nystagmus and find out more details about what is the type of nystagmus and what is the foveation dynamics. And acquired nystagmus would require uh, for other things. In non-surgical management, the proper glasses, tinted if albinism, contact lenses, prisms should be given, and auditory biofeedback and acupuncture have been used. But the most gratifying results are from the surgery if there is an eccentric gaze null. And these are by the Anderson Kestenbaum group of procedures. Our choice is to do an augmented Anderson's procedure in which the medial rectus is augmented from six to nine, actually, and lateral rectus 12 millimeters as a yoke muscle surgery. And this gives us very gratifying results. As you see here, the head posture is corrected and the nystagmus gets damped. Now, this is a pre and post video, and these are the recordings. In a pe missed periodic alternating null nystagmus, you may have a switch of head posture. If you have done an augmented Anderson's, there's nothing to worry. You can do the other two yoke muscles, and it will resolve the problem in another uh, 24 hours. If there is an associated squint, you have to take care of that squint. And same is this thing for chin up or chin down, or a torsional Keston bomb procedure, which may be done if there is a uh, eccentric null in different uh -huh. Procedures like four muscle resistance and the hurtle also have not been of much use. So I think the conclusions are these, that you need to tackle the augmented endoscence for up to 30 degrees, more than 40 degrees, resections may be added. And if there is a pan, you do a bilateral augmented endoscence. If there is any associated squint, correct that, and that may correct the nystagmus also. And if there is no definite null, we are still looking for an answer. Thank you all for this patient listening. Thank you very much. Dr. Rohit, you are there. Do you want to take a question or shall I ask? Go ahead, ma'am. Sure. I'll ask the question. You are the man to ask. <laughs> no, uh, so, uh, any role of pharmacological modification for nystagmus, Professor Pradeep Sharma? Yeah, I think that slide which I was showing that in the non-surgical ones, pharmacological modifications in the form of baclofen in the uh, acquired uh, pan can be done. Ah, that video, okay. It was not allowing me to have my video. So the baclofen can be used for acquired pens and also uh, drugs like the benzolamide. I think there is a study by uh, you yourself, which has been done uh, in our, one of the theses that we did. I do not see much uh, scope of that, although Dr. Hertel keeps talking about some magical results with some magical potion which can be used, but we are still waiting for that to come up. So as far as medical treatment is concerned, gabapentin or baclofen, have still some effect, but others are still, we have to look for it. Is there a surgery for head, head tilts effective? Yes, the head tilts can be corrected by, uh, uh, I mean, what we use is the oblique muscle surgeries, but people do shifting of the horizontal muscles vertically, or some people do the vertical recti shifted horizontally to correct the uh, head tilt, which is uh, causing the null. For an acquired periodic alternating nystagmus, would you think of uh, surgery if the medications fail? We should try baclofen, and if suppose the baclofen is not working, then we we can do the surgery, which will be the four muscle horizontal muscles, uh, uh, supramaximal recessions. But you would do a neuroimaging before that. Always in acquired, we'll have to look for the cause. It may be a post-traumatic, or it may be some intracranial space occupying lesion. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. We shall now move on to the neuro of health section, and our first speaker is Dr. Rohit Saxena, who is going to tell us the current updated guidelines of optic neuritis. On to you, Dr. Rohit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra, for the opportunity. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, yes. So uh, thank you. And I'll be talking about the basic guidelines of uh, optic neuritis, uh, currently what we are looking at. So we know that optic neuritis is inflammation of the optic nerve and can present as papillitis or retrobulbar neuritis. Uh, rarely you can see associated neuroretinitis, but that is not really considered uh, or you don't see it in a demyelinating optic neuritis. So we'll stick to essentially what we look in a demyelinating or a potentially demyelinating optic neuritis, which would essentially typically mean it's presenting as uniocular 
affecting between 20 to 45 to 50 years of age, usually will have some pain loss, some pain along with the visual loss. And visual loss is usually acute in a sense over hours to days. It's not so sudden like an ischemia that it's immediate, but it's over hours to days with mild pain, especially on eye movement. The vision loss peaks by two weeks. And by third week, you should start seeing some improvement. Presence of RAPD in a unilateral case and the fundus appearance as discussed. Typical optic neuritis is usually demyelinating, which would mean multiple sclerosis as your most common diagnosis, but other, in, other atypical features can be there, which may, consider, which may make you think in terms of infectious or para-infectious. If it's typical, it's most likely to be due to multiple sclerosis, but that does not mean that other causes can be excluded. Atypical optic neuritis would uh, basically mean very sudden loss, painless loss, older or very young age, bilateral involvement, very severe disc edema, or the vision loss continues to progress with no improvement beyond two to three weeks. This essentially means that there is a lower risk of multiple sclerosis or a demyelinating cause, and you must think of infective, compressive, or vascular causes. So typical optic neuritis, think isolated, idiopathic, or multiple sclerosis related. Atypical, think of other causes like NMO, uh, spectrum disorder, which may be acuporin 4, MOG, autoimmune, cryon, or post-vaccination. It's... Uh, the diagnosis essentially is clinical based on the vision loss, fundus appearance, presence of RAPD, feed loss, and an increased latency on VP and OCT, which is now increasingly being done to understand how it is progressing. Essentially, like I said, nothing is required for diagnosis, but we usually do a chest X-ray and electrolytes so that we can start the steroids without any major risk of side effects. In atypical cases, always rule out, rule out infective or inflammatory etiology. So MRI is the single most important investigation we now advise and should ideally be done in all patients, but it becomes extremely essential in atypical cases, recurrent cases, patients keen to know about their risk of multiple sclerosis and in children. The MRI should be done with contrast and ideally should be a T2 weighted with flare and contrast. If the MRI brain is normal or there are any other neurological symptoms or you're suspecting NMO, the spine also may be required to be imaged. So uh, MRI is the strongest predictor for development of multiple sclerosis and it has been seen that a uh, first presentation of optic neuritis has uh, a higher chance of developing multiple sclerosis if there is even one single lesion on the brain MRI. The treatment of acute optic neuritis is IV methylprednisolone, one gram over three days, although initially we were also giving dexamethasone as an alternative because of its lower cost and a little lower side effects. But now ease and availability of methylprednisolone, essentially we are giving methylprednisolone. If you suspect that it is NMO or atypical, you may even give it for up to five days. With, an, uh, so with a discussion with a neurologist, uh, Long-term disease-modifying agents can be planned, especially if there is a risk of the patient developing multiple sclerosis due to significant MRI lesions, or if there is a preceding history of neurological symptoms uh, that may be suggestive of multiple sclerosis. In India, we, we found a higher incidence of papillitis, bilaterality, and a lot of atypical features. And over time, we have realized that a large number, up to 10% of our patients, may be because of NMO. And NMO disorder or NMO spectrum disorder is a very important condition where our intervention has to be very aggressive. It is because of an antibody mediated disorder or antibodies acting on the CNS that are responsible for a very severe vision loss along with spine involvement. Again, an MRI of the brain may be suggestive and the enhancement of the involvement of the uh, optic nerves and the midbrain region may be suggestive of NMO, but ideally you need to get a blood uh, test of NMO, uh, NMO and MOC, so that you are able to identify the disease early and treat accordingly. Acute NMO is given IV methylprednisolone, but if it does not improve, a plasma exchange may be planned along with a neurologist. And a long-term immunosuppressive therapy is, re is required and not disease-modifying agents like an MS, which may actually increase the recurrences. 
Mog is the other syndrome that we are seeing frequently associated in our patients, presents with a little more benign form compared to NMO, but has much higher rate of recurrences. So these are the gross MRI changes. You can see unilateral involvement in MS, but chiasmal and bilateral or perineural involvement in Mog. And these changes can help us to early pick up the difference between the two. This was the way in enhancement or involvement of the optic nerve occurs. So classically, typical optic neuritis, IV methylprednisolone improves follow-up. No improvement of steroid dependence. Think of atypical features, work up better, get tested for NMO, MOG, MRI spine, and then tailor the management as per the requirement. You may require long-term management in the form of interferons or disease yeah, or disease modifying agents in optic neuritis and immunosuppressors in NMO mob. So work up better and manage appropriate. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sujada Guha is there? Okay. She's not there. Dr. Rashmin? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Is is it possible that there could be a situation where you're not going to treat? No treatment is still an option for optic neuritis. It it used to be uh, uh, when this NMO and MOG was not in the picture. The typical optic neuritis observation was one of the accepted mode of treatment. But now with uh, emergence of uh, NMO and as Rohit suggested that in India we have a higher incidence of it. In fact, within a couple of days. Ideally, steroids should be started in these patients because if you start steroids early and if you start with the anti-disease modifying, uh, the anti-inflammatory long-term uh, agents, then you are actually preventing paraplegia in these patients. So uh, observation is an option if you're very sure that you're not dealing with NMO or NMO spectrum. Right? If you are not there and the patient is pregnant, pregnancy moment, would you, and you know both, uh, those, uh, both the NMO and uh, MOG is not there. It's just an isolated optic neuritis on MRI and the patient is in the pregnant, then would you watch these patients or no, you would treat them? Um, you know, sometimes when, when the patient presents a little late and we find that the vision has already improved, say uh, the vision has uh, started low and has al already improved, then we are pretty sure it's a typical optic neuritis once we have ruled out MOG mm -hmm. and other things. And if there is a very high risk like you said, the patient is pregnant, we can still watch if it's, we are sure that it's a typical optic neuritis. Is there any other point, Dr. Murli, you have to add? Any questions we can ask? No, madam. Uh, so we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Rashmin Gandhi. He is going to be talking on mapping and managing visual loss of neuroophthalmic origin, the essentials. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chitra. I would like to thank you and entire ARC panel for inviting me for this uh, lovely program. So uh, my talk is going to be on mapping the vision loss of neuroophthalmic origin. How do we uh, pinpoint as to where the vision loss is arising from? So these are the areas that you're looking at. The vision loss of neuroophthalmic origin can be from the optic nerve or nerves in a bilateral problem, chiasmal area, a post-chiasmal uh, visual tract, which would be optic tract, radiation, and cortex, because of the involvement of the surrounding brain tissue, each one of these would come up with a different kind of signs and symptoms, and mapping would depend upon what kind of signs and symptoms that you are able to elicit clinically. So let's first look at the optic nerve. Now, the uh, optic nerve, uh, the acute loss of or a loss of vision of a neurophysic origin because of optic nerve can be unilateral or bilateral. A unilateral optic nerve lesion would show always, al always, always RAPD. So if you have a unilateral or asymmetrical optic nerve problem, you'll always find RAPD. You need to make sure that when you check for RAPD, you do it in the ideal uh, test conditions, which is dark room, patient looking straight, and both pupils are equally illuminated. That means the angle of illumination and the time for which each pupil is illuminated should be equal because RAPD is relative efferent pupil defect one pupil versus the other pupil. So if one visual pathway is uh, not as strong as the other visual pathway is where that visual pathway will demonstrate RAPD. So it's very important for as a preferred practice pattern to make sure that you check RAPD in the ideal test condition to uh, elicit the subtlest of the RAPD. Color vision deficiency is one of the hallmark features of, again, uh, most of the optic nerve problems. It is much more common or much more pronounced in somebody who has optic neuritis or nutritional uh, optic neuropathies, 
or uh, LHON, but it is seen practically in all, all forms of optic neuropathies. Visual field examination, contrast and brightness sensitivity and electrodiagnostics will form other, uh, other facets which will help you to map the loss of vision to a unilateral optic nerve disease. Uh, once you know that it's a unilateral optic nerve disease, the further mapping and management will depend upon the etiology. The, the commonest uh, causes of an acute unilateral optic neuropathy would be optic neuritis or uh, ischemic optic neuropathy. The neuritis, generally speaking, is a disease of a relatively younger population, though with NMO involved, the, the, this age group has become a little more uh, widened. The ischemic optic neuropathy by convention is generally a disease of somebody who is above 40, but again, uh, more and more cases are being seen which where ischemia occurs in a younger population. A subacute uh, unilateral optic nerve disease will map it either to LHON or uh, certain forms of toxic neuropathy like ethamitol can present with a subacute loss of vision. Gradual uh, onset loss of vision with a progressive progression of uh, loss of vision. Generally, you are dealing with a compressive uh, lesion or a nutritional deficiencies like vitamin B deficiency though they I have to say that they are much more common in both the eyes. What about optic nerve bilateral? Here you have to remember if bilaterally symmetrical optic nerve disease will not show you uh, RAPD, you may find that the pupils in a, in a severe neuronal loss, you find that the pupils are not as briskly reacting uh, as a normal pupil. You will find a color vision loss in most of the bilateral optic neuropathies. Fields become an important uh, differentiator from a bilateral optic nerve disease and a post-chiasmal or chiasmal uh, visual tract disease causing a bilateral vision loss. So uh, visual fields become an extremely important uh, factor here. Fundus examination again, because uh, one of the common bilateral optic nerve disease producing gradually uh, gradual onset loss of vision would be raised intracranial pressure causing papal edema, which if not resolved would cause a gradual onset progressive loss of vision. Acute bilateral optic nerve disease can be uh, optic neuropathies, rarely the optic neuropathies that we discussed can be bilateral, but in most instances, these uh, onset would be sequential and not bilateral simultaneous. So that's about mapping the vision to the optic nerve, either unilateral or bilateral. What about after optic nerve, how do we map it? So if, if there is a disease of the chiasm, patient can still have a loss of vision, uh, the fundus typically, if there is a, a compression at the optic chiasm, fundus will, uh, you will see a bow tie optic atrophy. The visual fields will show bi-temporal hemianopia or a junctional scotoma. Mainly what you are looking for in visual fields is a temporal hemianopia respecting a vertical midline. So any predominant temporal visual field effect, you should be suspicious of Other features like uh, 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 a nystagmus, seesaw nystagmus, or post fixation blindness should also be looked at. What about post chiasmal visual pathway, parietal, temporal, and occipital cortex? In parietal lobe, you'll have what is described as pi in the floor, that is contralateral inferior quadrant nuclei, which is homonymous. And you'll also find a deficiency of a pursuit disease to pursuit movement to the, to the same side, causing OKL asymmetry. Most of the time, parietal lobe uh, lesions will be ischemic or uh, compressive in origin. In temporal lobe, you'll have uh, what is described as pie in the sky, contralateral uh, uh, quadrant nuclei, which is uh, dense superiorly. You'll have other features like speech deficits. Again, you are probably looking at a tumor or ischemia in older patients. Occipital lobe, you'll find a much more congruous visual field effect. Again, in occipital lobe, you are looking at ischemia as a predominant cause. Thank you very much uh, for your patient here. Uh, actually, I was in the process of getting a radiologist, getting her a link, so it got, got stuck. So I have a question for you, and Murli, you would have to take the next question before yes. I could get my uh, radiologist in. How reliable are the confrontation visual fields in identifying visual loss? And what would be the strategies and automated perimeter you would use for a neuro-ophthalmic ring? Like, which one for what? So confrontation is an extremely useful tool in, in certain neuroaphthalmic condition. In fact, you might have, that's the only test might be available for you, let's say in somebody who is bedridden or has a neurological deficit, attention deficit, where they cannot go through 10 minutes of formal uh, visual tube assessment. 
somebody who does not have a vision which is less than six by 60, a formal field will not be reliable and confrontation would be uh, the only way by which you can map uh, the visual field effect. Uh, typically, if you have an optic nerve disease, you have seen the optic disc edema or a pair, uh, optic uh, pallor, you know that you're going to have a visual field effect which will be on the center. And even 24-2 is now an accepted of checking these patients. Any patient who has a visual field effect which is not entirely peripheral, I generally rely on 30-2. Somebody who keeps complaining of a visual field loss, which is not picked up in 30-2, is where I go uh, for a 60-field. Okay. Uh, so I have a question. Like, how do you typically diagnose reverse hereditary optic neuropathy? I mean, is it based on clinical features? Like, because mitochondrial analysis is quite expensive. Sorry, Muli, I couldn't uh, get uh, it. So how do you diagnose reverse hereditary optic neuropathy? Is it based on clinical? Because mitochondrial is quite expensive. Yeah, absolutely. You have to rely on, so any male patient, LHON will always be uh, one of your differential diagnoses. Male patient with an acute or a subacute loss of vision, the, the LHON goes up in the list. Male patient with a sequential loss of vision, one eye within a couple of, uh, within a week or a, uh, two weeks, the other eye, it goes up really high in, the, in your differential diagnosis. All these features with a family history, with a male having an optic neuropathy, you're practically looking at LHON. If the patient cannot afford uh, uh, the genome, uh, genomic uh, mapping and if he's in the right age group, nowadays uh, a lot of these patients, I do start with idibinom. Uh, the response is equivocal. There are patients who do improve, there are patients who do, they don't improve. Uh, so, regarding uh, the treatment of optic neuritis, uh, I mean, what would you do uh, if you have made a clinical diagnosis of optic neuritis corroborated on MRI? And uh, you have started the patient on pulse derived. Like I had a patient who had a vision of six by uh, twenty four to start with in her right eye, and on the second, on the third day of pulse derived, she went down to finger counting one meter, and then uh, after two weeks she recovered the vision back. So would that be a typical uh, thing that you, uh, in spite of starting pulse derived, you have progression or is that uh, absolutely? When he told us very clearly that if there is a dramatic impressive response to IV methylprednisone, you're probably dealing with something else, but not a typical optic neuritis. So it is, it is quite possible that even despite starting your IV methylprednisone, you may have some deterioration vision, depending upon at which phase of optic neuritis you've caught the patient. If despite steroids after two weeks, vision does not improve, is where you will start investigating, saying why the patient has not uh, responded to steroids. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, can we move on to the next presentation, ma'am? Madam, you are muted. We are on mute. You are muted, ma'am. Sumita Kundu, I could not connect her. There's too many phone calls coming. I couldn't do justice to my speakers. There's some link is not being given to her. So I think I'll move to oculoplasty. Murli, can you ensure that you speak to Grover? Uh, through Sai and get her in so that even if she is the last speaker, y'all can stay connected. We can oh, hear. I, I call, uh, Sai okay. right so I would now like to call on um, a very extremely sorry for the so much of phone call disturbances. Okay. Just a minute. We shall now move into the oculoplasty segment. Our first speaker is Dr. Santosh Honava, who would be talking on how to lift the veil on drooping eyelids preferred practice guidelines. On to you, Dr. Santosh. I thought I needn't introduce you. You're just too famous. Wow. Thank you, Chitra. I will be talking about uh, preferred practices in congenital ptosis that we follow. When you have a patient of congenital ptosis in front of you, these are the five questions that you ask and answer yourself. What is the severity of ptosis? Are there any complicating factors? What surgery would I perform? Is the surgery that I'm going to perform going to be safe for the patient? And what is the expected outcome? Am I going to fully correct or am I going to leave it undercorrected? For that, you need to go through a list of clinical tests, which are, I, I don't have time to enumerate, but let's go to the management straight. The first question is when to operate. If you have a newborn brought to you with bilateral severe ptosis, would you operate at that time? Generally not. You reassess the child once the child is fit for anesthesia at about six weeks three months, six months, and operate only if there is a head posture of this sort and the child is not able to clear the visual axis. Otherwise, early surgery is not really required in bilateral symmetrical ptosis. 
Whereas if it is bilateral asymmetrical or unilateral severe, then surgery should be done as soon as the child is fit for anesthesia because otherwise you will end up with deep amblyopia. This child has chin elevation with right eye ptosis. After surgery, you can see that the ptosis is corrected and the chin elevation also reverses. And this is just to make sure that the amblyopia does not develop. This is a reversible surgery using a suture material such as ethipon. Then when you uh, go to adults or older children, there are several situations. In a patient with mild ptosis, say 2 millimeter ptosis with 8 to 10 millimeter levator action, the first thing that you do is a phenylephrine test. If phenylephrine test is positive, then you go for mullerectomy. If it is negative, then the option is fastenal severed procedure. The classic indication is 2 millimeter ptosis, 10 or more millimeter of levator action. The standard thumb rule is that you resect every for every millimeter of ptosis, 2 millimeter of the tarsus and accompanying conjunctiva would be resected with the another thumb rule that at least 4 millimeter of the residual tarsus should be left so that the lid remains stable. This is how the surgery is performed simply using a RF electrode or scissors and knife and that's how the patient looks. This is a very elegant surgery. You should not have any worry about uh, dry eye, etc. because you would have still left 4 millimeter of the tarsus with enough meibomian glands. In levator surgery, we have several variants. For congenital ptosis specifically, we have levator resection and Wittnell slick. The classic indication for levator resection are ptosis more than 2 millimeter and levator action at least 4 millimeter or more. And there are two approaches. For patients who already have a lid crease and reasonable amount of levator action, you are better off doing a conjunctival approach. But for patients who don't have a lid crease, severe ptosis and poor levator action, then you prefer a skin approach. Then where to place the eyelid is always a question. The standard thumb rule is that for patients who have 6 to 7 millimeter levator action, you place the lid exactly where you want it postoperatively. If the levator action is poor, you overcorrect slightly. If the levator action is better than 6 to 7 millimeter, you undercorrect slightly because poorer the levator action, postoperative droop is common. If the levator action is better, postoperative lift is common. So this is the baseline, 6 to millimeter, 7 millimeter levator action leave the lid exactly where you want it to be postoperatively. This is under GA, but same thing can be adapted for local anesthesia as well. This is a patient who has undergone levator resection. Now for patients who have very severe ptosis, poor levator action, they are candidates for tarsofrontal sling, but they're not using the bro preoperatively because of severe amblyopia, they have no stimulus at all. Then you do what is called a Wittnell sling. Wittnell sling is performed internally, Wittnell's ligament is uh, attached to the tarsus internally through a skin approach and it works beautifully well. For patients who have severe ptosis with poor levator action, unilateral or bilateral, then we have tarsofrontal sling. These are the qualities of an ideal sling material, but the question is whether to use facial letter or silicone. Both are equally good. Silicone I prefer because it is reversible and adjustable, whereas facial letter being bio-integrable is not reversible and not adjustable. We use a typical pentagon technique for silicon sling. It's a fairly simple surgery. Leave the lid about one millimeter from the limbus and you would get nice results, unilateral or bilateral. This is a patient with unilateral severe ptosis with silicon sling. So ptosis, the assessment is very important. You always have to assess the patient properly and set a goal for yourself and to the patient. Perfection is an unreasonable goal in ptosis surgery and you should realize that and explain this in front of a mirror to the patient repeatedly until the patient and the family understand this very, very clearly. If you're a beginner surgeon, always follow a thumb rule and modify the thumb rule as and when you start getting your own results. And based on that, you can tweak the thumb rule a little bit. Anticipate and preempt complications and never hesitate to adjust early. If you have an undercorrection or overcorrection, which you notice in the post-operative period, Never wait for the tincture of time. It really doesn't work. You have to go, up, go back and adjust it early. And if you adjust it early in the first week itself, it's not a resurgery. It's a simple five-minute topical anesthesia adjustment. Thank you so much. To Dr. Grover or Dr. Santosh, uh, if uh, unilateral process correction if you're doing, it may look symmetrical when you look straight, but in down gaze, it's not symmetrical, no? So, uh, would you do a bilateral surgery or you do a unilateral? Generally, patients don't agree for bilateral surgery, but yes, in sling surgery, especially if you do a unilateral severe case, 
there are options to do bilateral sling as well without disinserting the levator well if you disinsert the levator and do bilateral sling it is very drastic measure for a normal lid so without disinserting the levator you can still do a loose sling so that when the patient looks down it will become symmetrical but most of the patients don't agree for it and dr grover has some experience doing that yes that's why dr grover your thoughts on that i liked your talk santosh it, it, for a non osteoplasty person i learned a lot yeah gagar mein sagar kind of talk <laughs> so beautiful talk very good talk yeah. for if for those who are willing for a bilateral surgery you can uh, for severe cases or for jaw winking cases where you disinsert the levator and convert it into a severe ptosis you can do a bilateral procedure provided the patient understands that this is for the purpose of creating a symmetry in downward gaze and in sleep so then you disinsert and do a bilateral fascial attesting one disadvantage of just putting in a sling is that sometimes that effort is lacking on the totic side to lift the um eyelid by using the brow action and you can still have an apparent under correction so for that reason sometimes a disinsertion of the normal muscle may be essential in severe cases to get a good symmetry but and that of course cannot be a universal formula uh, we go on to the next speaker dr ashok grower who is going to unravel the mystery of watery eyes dr santosh stay on with us uh preferred practice guidelines in a congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction so unraveling the mystery of watery eyes in 5 minutes mm, the watery eyes in early infancy may represent congenital yes. glaucoma which should be excluded but the lacrimal outflow difficulties most common being nasolacrimal duct obstruction are the more common cause the nasolacrimal duct has a large osseous part and a small 5 mm membranous part the obstruction most commonly is at the block at the valve of hasner which is the lower end of the membranous part where it opens into the nose but there are several other abnormal ways in which the opening can end the clinical presentation as epiphora discharge and matting unilateral or bilateral is the common one regurgitation on pressure is the commonest sign but acute presentations can also occur the natural history is that 95% present with epiphora in the first month and 96% have an overall spontaneous resolution in the first year conservative management comprising the appropriate way of hydrostatic massage over the sac or a minimally invasive technique like probing and surgery which is the dacrosystorhinostomy constitute the mainstay of it is important to hydrostatic massage well and explain it well to the parents the probing and syringing is done if the watering persists it can either be done early or at about 9 to 12 months or later the consensus is on its use at about 12 months or later the probing technique will not be detailed here because of paucity of time but one needs to guard against false passages and the difficulties in complicated nld obstructions success rates can be very high up to 90% failure only because of improper technique or recurrence of obstruction or anatomical variations the success is less if you do it late more than 36 months of age or in complex nld hole failed probing can be tackled by repeat probing if it has been done outside and you haven't done it earlier or an inferior turbinate in fracture or balloon catheter dilatation silicon intubation endoscopy has proved to be a useful tool and where all other measures fail by dacrosystorhinostomy inferior turbinate in fracture has proved to be a very useful technique in my hand it works in most of the cases of failed probing balloon catheter dilatation using a specially designed balloon for the purpose is a very useful tool but limited by the cost and the results are virtually the same as they are for silicon intubation which may be a less costly option 
The success results with silicon intubation, primarily done in failed cases, is a useful technique also in complex obstructions. Nasal endoscopy has added a new dimension, especially for complex NLDO, failed probing, nasal cysts or other associated pathology and probing success rates improve with this. Let's look at uh, the endoscopic visualization and its role uh, in those cases which are complex. So we are seeing the inferior turbinate, we can see the inferior matus, and when we pass the probe, we can normally see the probe coming in. Here we only see it tenting the mucosa. And in such a situation, you can, if you're working under nasal endoscopic control, use a sickle knife as we are doing here to get an opening and get the mucosa to be opened up so that okay. the probing can be successful. After so this is it, no? where we can now see that the probe has now been reached the nose. Dacrocystorhinostomy is indicated in cases where the obstruction persists in spite of all the procedures that we've spoken about. External and endoscopic have both been advocated, but external is the more common standard approach for children. There are certain technical difficulties in dacrocystorhinostomy in children, but the results are still very good. So congenital nasolacrimal duct, duct obstruction is a fairly common condition. Almost up to 3 to 4% of children will have it but currently available techniques offer a very high rate of success. Newer techniques, especially endoscopic visualization and endoscopy guided probing have contributed to greater understanding and better success rates in congenital NLDO. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, is there a particular situation wherein you will not be conservative and wait for probing, but think of doing it earlier? Well, one very important reason is when the parents are overtly concerned and uh, they are uh, very anxious, then you may opt to do it early at the age of a few months. Then, of course, there are those conditions, medical conditions, where you may be forced to do it early. One of them is if there are recurrent attacks, which are relatively less common in children. And a very unusual one is a congenital dactyocystose C. Yes. where there may be unilateral or bilateral um, non-compressible uh, sac swellings on both the sides. They need to be probed because, one, you don't want that kind of a swelling to remain, and number two, some of them are associated with cysts in the nose, which may have a bearing on the breathing of the child. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, we go on to Vidya and that, then after that, we will take our radiologist, Dr. Sumita Kundu's talk. Uh, Vidya, can we have you sharing your screen? She is going to be talking on how to put the pieces together, the preferred practice guidelines in an eyelid trauma management. You should unmute yourself, Vidya. Yes, madam, I've done it. I think I'm audible now. Yeah. Very good afternoon. And I shall be presenting on uh, preferred practice pattern in the eyelid trauma management. Uh, ocular adnexial injury is a very commonly encountered uh, clinical condition. And uh, we need to know the basic principles of primary repair. When we repair a lid tear, we want to prevent the exposure keratopathy, ocular surface disruption, we want to address the aesthetic concerns of the patient and the probable and uh, possible functional problems that may be associated with the lid tear. The basic uh, principles remind the same. We need to have a very careful history followed by meticulous examination and we need to prioritize our treatment depending upon the condition. Detailed history should be taken in case of an ocular injury and uh, here we need to give more importance to the mode of injury so that we don't miss out any orbital penetration or any intraocular foreign bodies. And we also should need to cover the medical legal aspects of the surgical surgery and the history taking. We need to know about the systemic illness that the patient may be having. And uh, for general anesthesia purpose, we should be knowing about the time since last feed. 
Methodical ocular examination is mandatory. We need to check and document vision in both the eyes. Look specifically for uh, relative afferent pupillary defect. We should always be ruling out the intraocular injury and uh, globe rupture and uh, muscle injury. Wherever and whenever appropriate, we should be performing the appropriate radiology workup in a case of lit tear. And it's mandatory that we should have preoperative photographs before we do the lit tear repair. And it's important we prioritize our treatment because in case of lid head injury, patient might be unstable uh, general condition. So we need our priority is to attend to the patient's general condition and stabilize him rather than attending to the lid uh, condition. In case of globe rupture and uh, lid tear, our priority goes to attending to globe rupture first followed by lid tear repair. Most of the lid repair can be done under local anesthesia, but in case of children or wherever we anticipate longer time due to extensive injury to uh, repair, probably we, that those cases can be done under general anesthesia. The first thing that we need to do is a thorough wound it's inspection. Always look for foreign body. Many of these lid tears appear a little larger because of the uh, retracted orbicularis. So it may not be as large as this, but always look for the foreign body, remove that before we attempt to repair that. In case of lid injuries, we do not re uh, require usually an excessive debridement because eyelid is a very vascular structure. So next when we go on to the uh, eyelid marginal repair, the principles are we need to have equal depth placement of suture so that we have an everted eyelid margin at the end of repair. So here I'm taking a three millimeter end from both the cut ends and reversing the needle take one millimeter on either side. So when I tie my suture, it's going to be everted. The lid margin is going to be everted so that I have a proper uh, wound architecture. And once I cut the suture, once I tie the suture, I'm going to be leaving a long cut end so that the subsequent sutures when I take, those sutures can be, this long suture end can be involved in the subsequent suture bite so that it doesn't abrade the cornea. So the material that I'm using here is a 6O vicryl. 6O silk can also be used, but that has to be removed. So the, rem the thing that we need to remember is a far, far near, near pass technique that used to uh, suture the eyelid marginal thing. If at all we are repairing the tarsus, it should never be a full thickness repair. So moving on to the canalicular injury, whenever we have a medial canthal injury, canalicular injury is, should be kept in mind. So the technique here is to identify the cut end of the canaliculus and to re uh, repair it. So the thing I'm using here is a probe to allow for the nat natural passage of the thing. And then I'll be using a monocanalicular silicon stent, which I'll be putting in and uh, secure it followed by a peri pericanalicular suturing technique. The one that I'm inserting is a monocanalicular stent, a silicon monocanalicular stent. The questions that can be usually in our mind would be like whether uh, we need to repair both upper and lower things. Yes, we need to repair both the upper and lower canaliculus. And the timing of surgery is as early as possible. However, if the patient presents a little later time, late intubation or still possible can be tricky though. Canalicular stents are usually retained for about four to six weeks. And if at all, we do not have canalicular, monocanalicular stents, there are cheaper alternatives that are available. So uh, the presence of orbital fat is important sign and that indicates the violation of the orbital septum. And in case of upper eyelid, we need to look for the levator involvement. Do not suture the orbital septum. It might result in case of... Uh, Upper eyelid, it might result in a restrictive uh, lag of thalamus like this. First opportunity is always our best opportunity. So any irregular oppositions would require a uh, reconstruction and post reconstruction, this is how the aesthetic outcome. And in case of uh, lid tears following uh, dog bites, copious uh, wound irrigation, rabies prophylaxis, tetanus prophylaxis to be observed. And uh, we need to infiltrate the area before we suture with local immunoglobulins. Primary wound repair can be done. And there is definite role for systemic antibiotics to prevent wound contamination. And we need to remember the complications whenever we are dealing with uh, the lid tear, like a poor wound architecture or a medial canthal distortion or traumatic doses. Sorry to interrupt, no this is my last time. Can I request you to sum up? Okay, ma'am. I think we have time for one more talk, right? Doctor.
Hello. Yes, we have time for one more talk. Uh, yes, yeah. Just one pillar question. Dr. Santosh, how would you identify the cut end of the canaliculus? During that time, Dr. Sumita Kundu, could you uh, sh uh, share your slide, uh, screen? I think it's easy if you look at uh, the uh, lid under microscope, it's easy to identify as a pale area. Otherwise, you can use Morrison, modified Morrison technique, you know, pigtail probe, which is a blunter version of the regular pigtail probe. There are a lot of options. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we just uh, have a guest speaker all the way from Calcutta who's going to be talking to us about radiology and neuroophthalmology. So look forward to hearing you. We heard a lot about you. I was thinking we would be there for our uh, conference at Calcutta. But the fact that we could get you on the virtual webinar, we are truly lucky. Thanks to Dr. Sujata Guha. On to you, Dr. Sumita. You could share your slide. You could uh, unmute yourself and start talking. Thanks a lot, Dr. Santosh, Dr. Usha Kim, Dr. Ashok Grover for being with me for this brief oculoplasty session. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra and your team for having me here today and accommodating me, though I'm a little late. My topic of presentation will be radiology and neuroophthalmology, when it would translate to a better management. One second, and there is some technical glitch here. Okay. Diagnostic imaging is a major component of evaluation and management of neuro-ophthalmological disorders. It is imperative for the radiologist to get relevant clinical information from the neuro-ophthalmologist so that expensive investigations like CT and MRI can be tailored for each patient's particular problem. To evaluate the orbital and visual pathway as well as the cranial nerves and other brain structures, MRI is the superior modality compared to CT, particularly three Tesla MRI with contrast. X-ray skull does not have as much role nowadays as CT and MRI. Dedicated orbital USG with high frequency transducer and Doppler studies can be helpful in certain scenarios. The common indications, as we all know, are acute and chronic unilateral or bilateral visual impairment, fundal abnormalities, ocular motility disorders, hemifacial spasm, congenital and acquired cranial nerve abnormalities, and other congenital brain disorders. Just a uh, introduction, like to, if CT scan is there, then it can be helpful for SOL classifications, radio opaque foreign bodies, and orbital wall pathologies, including evaluation of orbital fractures and tumors. But it is MRI of the brain and spine, which plays an important role in differentiation between multiple sclerosis versus neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder in patients who are coming with features of optic neuritis. The distribution of the lesions in the brain and in the cord differs between multiple sclerosis and NMO. Here we have short segment and small focal lesions in the cord and typical distribution in the brain in MS, whereas the distribution is little dif different and with long segment extens uh, extensive uh, involvement of the cord in the um, neuromyelitis optica. As far as retinoblastoma is concerned, both CT and MRI play a role, but CE MRI is superior in evaluation of extraocular and intracranial extensions, and also in evaluation of trilateral and quadrilateral retinoblastomas. Optic nerve gliomas, of course, you can see how beautifully MRI is showing this extensive optic nerve glioma involving almost the entire optic nerve as well as the optic chiasmatic regions and the contrast study is showing areas of solid and cystic components. MRI has a very important role to play in evaluation of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It's not that always we can give the answer, but very often we can show tortuosity of the intraorbital optic nerves and the widening of the perineutal CSF, partial empty cell turcica, and MR venogram may show stenosis of the transverse sinuses. 
Intracranial neoplasms causing visual impairment, of course, MRI or CT would be helpful in both. This is a patient with a large enhancing mass in the left parito-occipital lobe. It is patient is having raised intracranial tension. We can see that there is bulging of the optic nerve heads. This lesion has a lot of blood degradation pro products within it. And in the perfusion-weighted image, there is not much of hyperperfusion. So all these together point to the fact that this is most likely not a malignant lesion, but something which has a lot of blood degradation products like a cavernous angioma. Of course, these are routine MRI brains which are showing cellar and supracellar lesions which can lead to visual problems and also cranial nerve pathologies like in this cavernous sinus schwannoma. Congenital disorders like septo-optic dysplasia, this little baby was born blind and she was named Gan Gandhari by her uh, adopted home. We can see that the interventricular septum is absent, box-like ventricles, bilateral microphthalmia in septo-optic dysplasia. In leukodystrophies, of course, MRI is the modality of choice. This was a young boy who came with visual abnormalities, other neuro deficits, and he was diagnosed as adrenal leukodystrophy, where we can see the brain parenchymal changes in the typical distribution of posterior adrenal leukodystrophy. Vascular lesions like carotico-cavernous fistulas, you see a very, see a very busy um, left cavernous sinus. And here is another patient with cranial nerve palsies showing a throm partially thrombosed intracranial aneurysm. As far as uh, cranial nerves are con concerned, once again, it is MRI which will show high resolution images with uh, showing the optic nerves. This is a patient who came with diplopia. And here she is having a small nodular lesion which is enhancing in the contrast enhanced study because of a schwannoma or a meningioma in the Dorello's canal, thus involving the sixth cranial nerve. Neurovascular conflict is another condition where MRI is very helpful with MR angiography. The tortuous anterior inferior cerebellar artery is seen here and uh, forming a loop around the root entry zone of the left facial nerve, leading to hemiplasia spasm. Finally, this is the last slide in this post, in this COVID era, one cannot but show changes which happen in the brain as well as in the uh, paranasal sinuses and optic nerves in mucor mycosis. This is, I think, the last slide and my final conclusion would be availability of advanced imaging modalities is necessary for better diagnosis and management of neuro-ophthalmological disorders. And it's the combined efforts of ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, neurologists and radiologists, which ensures best diagnosis and management of these patients. I thank you for your patient hearing. It was really worthwhile to wait and listen to your talk. Doctor, it thank was you, so, thank so, you. so very nice. Just one question I would ask. Yes, please. Um, I mean, there's so much you could ask, but it's short of time. What is the relevance of using a stronger, stronger magnets in magnetic resonance? Yes, stronger magnets, not only do they give better resolution images, particularly for visualization of thin structures like cranial nerves, even the optic nerve edema, demyelination, and also the scan time becomes a little reduced. Patients with orbital imaging, they tend to move their eyes. So we prefer to take images which are slightly shorter in duration, comfortable for the patient also. Thank you so much. So nice to see you. And have so nice to meet you, meet you also, Dr. Right. Chitra. Really, Thank very you. nice. Thank, Thank you, everybody, for an amazing, uh, though I know we really crunched uh, pediatrics, neuro-ophthalmology, oculomacy, everything into one session, but it was truly enjoyable. And you also beautifully utilized the six minutes to transfer so much of information. Thanks a lot for a wonderful learning webinar. Look forward to get back to you the future dates with our ARC webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, all the doctors and all the speakers. To please, uh, thank you for keeping it on time. Thank you.